Hey everyone, Matt Smith with Rebellion Air, and today we're going to be taking a look at my estimates for Tesla's Q4 2023 earnings. All right, one of the most impactful changes in Q4 was the price cuts, uh, especially on Model S and X, but also in 3 and Y, at least in the United States. Now, countering that, we did see some very modest price increases in China, so that may have helped to offset this a little bit. So for Q4, uh, we do have these price cuts. And then what we're going to be doing is just taking a look at how do these impact revenue. So we know the deliveries from the production and delivery report. I've included 300 uh, deliveries for Cybertruck. Uh, not very impactful, just a, a reasonable estimate for what they might have delivered in Q4. Um, we'll skip full self-driving for now. I don't expect there's any major changes in take rate. And I'm assuming a global estimate of around 6%, which is uh, on the small side, uh, but really shouldn't be a major change quarter over quarter one way or another. Um, Moving on down, uh, one of the big surprises in Q3 was the credit revenue. Uh, so that was $554 million, which was quite elevated compared to the around $300 million or so that they have historically kind of averaged around. Um, so in Q4, I'm assuming that will come back down to around $350 million or so. Um, then some very modest kind of adders for acceleration boost, full self-driving subscriptions, enhanced autopilot, that sort of thing. Uh, but again, no major changes uh, quarter over quarter there. So that's it on the auto side, at least for revenue. Moving on to energy, one of the big items is obviously <laughs> Megapack. So it's always an estimate of how many gigawatt hours have been deployed in the quarter. And then beyond that, how does that translate to revenue? Um, there is a pretty meaningful lag in the revenue recognition of a lot of the deployments. So that's why if you just take the, the pure energy or at least the stationary storage revenue, uh, you can make a reasonable estimate of what that might be by backing out an estimate of solar revenue uh, and divide that by the uh, gigawatt hours that were deployed. That can give you an estimate of the dollars per kilowatt hour that Tesla might have realized on average. When we do that in the historical periods, we're actually getting numbers that are way too low. Uh, around, well, under $350 per kilowatt hour. Tesla's cheapest stationary storage pack would be like a, a mega pack sold at scale at a four hour duration. Um, even that is going to be over $400 per kilowatt hour. So that shows us that the deployments are ramping much faster than the actual recognition of revenue. So at some point that has to unwind as the historical deployments become a greater portion of the actual revenue, which is recognized in any given period. So I am assuming that that will increase from around $350 per kilowatt hour last quarter to around $425 per kilowatt hour this quarter. So of course, all of these estimates are gonna be off to some degree, but it's a, at least a reasonable estimate of, of where we might land. Um, so we're getting total energy revenue of around $2.1 billion, which is a pretty meaningful uptick over Q3 in this estimate. Uh, we'll see if that actually happens. In, in my mind though, you've seen these deployments continue to increase quarter over quarter, yet the total energy revenue has essentially remained flat for three quarters in a row. Uh, that just can't continue. At some point, you're gonna start recognizing more revenue from the historical projects. So I, I do think that'll start to hit in Q4, uh, but we'll, we'll see what happens. So putting it all together, um, we've got the leasing revenue, which, which goes into the automotive revenue. We also have this $2.1 billion of energy revenue, and I'm assuming a modest increase in the services revenue um, as well to reflect the fact that you've got uh, more drivers out there, more supercharging stations, more service, that sort of thing. Uh, so altogether, $26.379 billion, which if you're only looking at top line, looks like a pretty nice improvement quarter over quarter. And of course, that's just what you'd expect from delivering so many more vehicles in Q4. Uh, but the real question is, are you making money selling those extra cars? Uh, one of the things that I do that is maybe a little bit different than a lot of the other analysts out there is look at the core manufacturing margin. Now, this is a phrase that I have uh, essentially made up or coined. Uh, but it's really looking at what is the automotive gross margin stripping out both credit revenue, which a lot of analysts do, but also an estimate of full self-driving revenue. So if you strip out both of those items, which are pure margin, uh, then you're you're left with an actual estimate of the manufacturing margin. So how profitable is your manufacturing? Um, in order to do this quarter over quarter, I'm always trying to think what are the things that have changed. Now, in the, in the last several quarters, we've had price cut after price cut, which has uh, obviously created a lot of strain on that manufacturing gross margin, but there are always offsets to that. So um, in Q4, let's take a look at what some of those things might be. Well, I'm looking at Q3 and I'm looking at Q4 and, and trying to get an estimate of what are some of the different puts and takes 
that, that might be impacting the overall uh, gross margin. So uh, obviously we've got a, a price cut for Model S and X here, uh, but we also had higher delivery. So we've got to keep in mind when I'm looking at these numbers that the overall cost of goods sold should increase just because Model S and X is a much more expensive car to make than Model 3 and Y. 3 and Y also had a, a bit of a price cut and um, then there's the cost of goods sold. So um, when you're delivering fewer cars in a quarter, you've got all that fixed overhead that needs to be split over a smaller amount of cars. Um, and so when you're running at full capacity, you're, you're just gonna be more efficient. So I'm assuming uh, a th about a thousand dollar decreased in the China made uh, vehicles. This is both Model 3 Highland, but also the Model Y. It's not an aggressive assumption, but um, certainly I think a reasonable estimate of, of where they might land. So now I've got this other line here, which I'm calling other cost of goods sold per car. Um, so this is, obviously you've got Fremont, you've got Berlin, you've got Austin. Most of those are gonna be three and Y. I'm not expecting any major changes in the cost of goods sold structure out of those plants, other than the fact that it got uh, additional cost of goods sold, just from the fact that you're selling a higher percentage of your overall deliveries are gonna be S and X versus the, the three and Y in Q4 relative to Q3. So I'm increasing this, you know, other cost of goods sold um, in order to account for, for that kind of mix shift between the vehicles. Um, so I've got an estimate here of the vehicles which were made in China and then all, all of the other cars essentially. And then you can essentially just uh, multiply these, these figures by each other to um, get a, an overall cost of goods sold. And then you can um, take the the ratio of that to your uh, well, your gross margin essentially to the to the price or to the revenue, and you get a, a overall margin. What I got when I went through this whole exercise is a margin decrease of 1.4 percent quarter over quarter, uh, which is pretty meaningful. And and I think I'm hoping to be wrong on this, but when I'm just thinking of what's changed and how do the price cuts impact margin, and then offsetting that with any other benefits that we might get from, you know, mix shift and everything else. Um, I've tried to cut this a couple different ways and this is what I'm coming up with. Now you might be thinking this is kind of a weird way of doing it. I've tried a very detailed build up before and just to give you an idea where I'm looking at all the different vehicles, uh, where they're manufactured, uh, where they're being sold and trying to come up with uh, like revenue and cost of goods sold this way. And, and when I went extremely detailed, I actually had uh, by far my, my greatest variance. So the two quarters I did this were Q3 of 2022 and Q4 of 2022. Um, these are my estimates up here and they're by far the, the times that I was furthest off on, on my estimates. So there are some times where details do not translate to increases in accuracy. Bringing this together, 1.4% reduction in what I'm call, calling core manufacturing margin. Um, the numbers down there don't translate exactly to this because they do have some, the, the top line numbers anyways, include um, credits and full self-driving. So I'm stripping those out here, but, uh, but you take the full 1.4% out. Um, and so that gets to a, a core manufacturing gross margin of 12.2%. Um, so adding back the full self-driving and credit revenue, getting total automotive gross margin of 16.4%. So that's, I think would be a bit of a surprise, certainly lower than I think most people are expecting. We can move through the rest of this rather quickly. Uh, I'm assuming a very modest increase in the energy gross margin to 25%. Uh, overall gross profit of just over $4.2 billion or in a total gross margin of 16%. When I've been critical of Tesla's price cuts, it's, be, it's because they uh, really have a, a, a very major impact on uh, in decreasing gross margin. I'm not going to go through uh, all of these, you know, R&D, SG&A, SG &A, and then uh, stock-based comp, um, except to say that I do think stock-based comp might take a bit of a, a hit in Q4. Um, we heard some stories of uh, people not getting their uh, stock bonuses in Q4. So if that were to happen, then I would expect that there has been less um, stock-based comp running through the income statement in Q4. So dropping all this down to kind of the, the bottom line here, I'm getting total net income of $1.96 billion. And that translates to gap EPS of 56 cents and adjusted EPS of 65 cents. Uh, this would be actually a decrease quarter over quarter, despite a, a pretty meaningful increase uh, in volumes. Uh, so I don't think this would be <laughs> received very well, to be honest with you, but it is my best estimate of where I think Tesla will land. Um, now you can see here, going back to my history of uh, doing this, uh, I've been making quarterly estimates and, and putting them out there publicly since Q4 of 2019. And I have 
for the most part, always been uh, higher than Wall Street. This is the first time in the history of my doing this uh, where I'm actually lower than Wall Street for the first time. So Wall Street is actually at 74 cents in earnings per share for uh, Q4. I'm at 63, so a pretty meaningful uh, divergence from what the street is expecting. Um, I've tried a couple different sensitivities too, like trying to trying to assume that the margins aren't hit nearly as bad. And I was struggling to get many scenarios which yielded earnings per share of more than say 72 cents. Um, so I hope to be wrong. I really hope Tesla does crush it, but um, I always try to just be as neutral as possible and give my honest take of, of what I think is going to happen. And for Q4, unfortunately, I'm expecting a bit of a miss for Tesla, uh, total adjusted earnings per share of just 63 cents. So uh, that's it for my Q4 2023 earnings per share estimates. If you'd like to learn more about what we're doing here at Rebellion Air, check out rebellionair.com. We are pretty unique among financial advisors because we're not just relationship managers or sentient hair gel, as I've, I've heard some people <laughs> comment before. Uh, you're not going to find Bradford and I out on a golf course just trying to uh, win new business. We're just in the weeds here doing actual analysis and trying to let our our work and our modeling and our analysis speak for itself. So if you're interested in learning more about what we can do, check out rebellionair.com. I'm Matt Smith. Thanks for watching. And let's hope that I'm wrong and Tesla posts 80 cents or something like that. But uh, we'll find out tomorrow after the bell.